are listening to The Itch, a podcast exploring all things allergy, asthma, and immunology. I'm your co-host, Courtney, a real-life allergy, asthma, and eczema girl. And I'm your second host, Dr. Payal Gupta, a board-certified allergy, asthma, and immunology doctor. Courtney and I hope to balance each other out so that we get you all the information that you want and need about allergies, asthma, and immunology. Food allergy people get a bad rep when it comes to being the butt of the joke in movies and on TV. We tend to be an easy laugh and the perfect specimens for some good old physical comedy. But what impact does this have on people who manage food allergies? And what impact does it have on people who have very little knowledge of food allergies? And this is the only representation of living with food allergies that they know. We chat with Dr. Manisha Raylan about how food allergies are portrayed in the media, both the bad and the good sides, plus how things have or haven't changed since Hitch popped a straw in a Benadryl bottle and called it a day. We start by talking about the medical side of anaphylaxis before we dive headfirst into breaking down some famous food allergy scenes. I hope you have as much fun listening to this episode as we did making it. everyone. Today we have a really special episode with another guest allergist and we're going to discuss all things media. So as you know, media consumes and shapes our perspectives of the world. And how does this impact food allergies? Well, according to a study by Ruchi Gupta, who we have previously had on the podcast, 49.6% of the general population believe that television is the best way to learn about food allergies. Unfortunately, oftentimes the media is not accurate in the way that it portrays allergies. Today, we're you know going to discuss how can that cause harm? How could it be better? And how can we talk to our kids about these scenes? We will be discussing all of this today with Dr. Manisha Raylan, a pediatric allergist immunologist in New York. Dr. Raylan has a special interest in anaphylaxis and is on the anaphylaxis committee for the American Academy of Allergy, Asthma, and Immunology and has helped us put together an interesting show for you today. So let's get started. Manisha, can you start by defining what anaphylaxis is? Yeah. Hi, you guys. Thank you for having me on the show. Let's get right into it. So the definition of anaphylaxis is actually one of three. Back in 2005, a multinational and multidisciplinary group sat down together and said, what is anaphylaxis? It's confusing. It's multi-system. There is lots of different variable ways that people can present. And it depends a lot on, you know, where you were in the world, what you were eating, doing, thinking, breathing, that kind of stuff. So they came up with one of three definitions. The first is an acute onset of an illness within minutes to hours. And that's kind of key. This is fast and sudden with involvement of the skin, the mucosal tissue or both, and then also to have difficulty breathing or decreased blood pressure. So this is kind of scary. So it happens fast and you pretty much feel the symptoms right away. The second definition is once you've already kind of identified what your allergy might be. So for those of you listening, food allergy being a common one. So you've uh, been exposed to a likely allergen that you and your allergist have identified as a trigger for you, and you get two or more body systems involved. This also occurs really rapidly after exposure. The involvement could be of the skin, the respiratory, um, decreased blood pressure, stomach symptoms. But again, you have to have two. And a common example I use on this one is you're itching, you have hives, and you start vomiting. That's two different body systems. And you've recently ingested a cookie or you were out at a restaurant and this started happening. The third definition is really scary, the decreased blood pressure. And this is when you've been exposed to a known allergen. So this is almost shock-like. And so the out of the three definitions, I'd say the most common one that I come across is definition number two, being an allergist. We define your allergies, you get into a contact, you have a reaction. Yeah, I agree, Manisha. I think uh, definition number two is the easiest sometimes for patients to grasp too, where it's that you have an exposure, that you have a reaction that's fairly immediate and that it affects two or more body parts. And that I think is the key definition that I use most often in my clinic too. What do you think about that, Courtney? Definition number two is the easiest one as a patient for me to go, 
what's happening right now and then I can assess, okay, I have this, this and this and I can outline all my symptoms and then I can move on to treating what's going on in my body. I think sometimes I'm a person who needs a checklist and so the second definition really helps me go, okay, I've got hives, I'm feeling itchy, my stomach is getting all crampy, uh, I'm starting to feel really panicked and flushed and so when I start going through these checklists, I can go, okay, next step, get my EpiPen, you know, or whatever I need to do for my action plan as a patient. Definition number two is the easiest to understand and the easiest to implement when you're having a reaction, whereas definition one and three are maybe a little bit more highbrow (laughs) in the allergy world, if you could say that. Yeah, I think definition one and three is just to cover all medical scenarios because anaphylaxis can happen anywhere, you know, from your home to a hospital setting to an to an operating theater or operating room. So it just covers all the spectrums. Also, what's important is that what you define for definition number two is you talked about all these different symptoms. And I think that's going to come into the conversation later on when we talk about what we see on TV and in movies, because we kind of see the same like three things that go on in most cases. It's generally like they're itchy, they get super swollen in funny ways, and they get hives, I guess. So it's it's just like they, there's so much more nuance to an allergic reaction and what we see in the media only has a very small portrayal of what an allergic reaction looks like. So I just wanted to plant that seed here. Before we jump into the movies and TV shows that we're going to talk about, I'm just curious because 50% of the general population say they get their information about allergies from the media. What about what you guys see in your offices. So in your experience, do patients come and reference TV shows or movies when they're describing what's going on? For me, absolutely. I think the most common ones that we'll we'll be talking about in just a couple of minutes, this is where I compiled my list. Um, there's a few popular shows back in the 90s. I'm a 90s baby. Um, so we see those, I would say about maybe once a week or at least a couple of times a month, I'll hear about TV shows and um, what people's symptoms look to like, because sometimes it, the anaphylaxis happens so quickly and they're unable to document it on their cell phone. A lot of people do try to take pictures and show me what you know their skin look like, their lips look like whatever. And so if they didn't have that at the moment, they'll just reference the movie and say, oh, yeah, remember how this person's face looked? That's exactly what mine looked like. Yeah, absolutely. I think for me, sometimes I reference certain movies. I'm also grew up watching like all the 90s movies. And so Hitch was a big one. And some of my younger patients kind of look at me confused, like, what is she talking about? (laughs) But, you know, the way that he has very obvious symptoms, I use that as a reference. It's not the best reference, but it helps me differentiate between a sensitivity and a true food allergy at times, just being able to kind of reference some of those scenes as all the symptoms that can occur when you're having a reaction. Kyle, I think of it like it's a common ground that we all share because we can't talk about other patients without breaking HIPAA, but this is a patient on the screen, someone that we can all relate to and all have access to. So even if they have not seen the movie, they can Google it later and they'll see the scene that you're referring to. And it's Um, I think it's something that, like I said, we can all kind of unite on. Yeah. And that's why I think it's so important that the media does a better job at portraying accurately what the reactions will look like and what the treatment sequence should be. And because, again, like you said, it it can be a common ground and it can be a great teaching tool. But when it's not done right, then that's when we get into issues. And that's really why, you know, why we're doing this episode, just to talk to families and people about the media and how we need to pay attention to what our kids are watching to make sure that they're not getting the wrong message and that it's not doing harm. That was really awesome. I mean, I grew up watching 90s and, you know, 2000s stuff as well. And what's interesting is that most of the things we're going to reference are actually pretty old now. They're 15 years old almost, like Hitch 2005, Monster-in-Law also the year 2005, which is interesting. So apparently something was going on in the world of movies, like obviously some screenwriter had (laughs) anaphylaxis or something. Thing. And then we're also going to hit on the controversial Peter Rabbit from 2018. And then two other TV shows we might reference would be Freaks and Geeks, which is from 99 and Friends. I'm not sure what year the episode we're going to talk about aired, but we know that Friends is also quite dated. So we are going to talk about some shows that I think have painted a picture of what an allergic reaction looks like for 
parents a lot of the time and also for adults who had watched that and now are having late allergic reactions later in their lives. How we're going to structure this conversation, because I think there's so much to talk about and I feel like we can go in so many different directions, is that we've outlined a couple of discussion points. And the first one we're going to talk about is humor and how an allergic reaction is used in a very funny way. It's used for a laugh and not an educational moment in a movie. There is an a study that was done in 2015 that looked at how participants exposed to more humorous portrayals of food allergies were expected to have a more negative attitude towards those with food allergies, perceptions of food allergies in general, and to be less likely to take life-saving measures in an emergency. Can you guys break down what that means for us? Yeah, absolutely. So anaphylaxis, as we were just defining it, I mentioned a couple of times drop in blood pressure. This is pretty serious. This is something that needs to be given immediate attention. And we all know that first line treatment for anaphylaxis is epinephrine. So I think that when we humorize a serious situation, sometimes it can backfire on us. It's great for the quick laugh in the moment for the patient that's undergoing the actual episode. It's life threatening. It's scary. This could be the last day, the last minute that you see this person breathing and that's not cool and that's not okay. And I think it kind of minimizes to people that are not in our allergy world how serious this really is is. And so when they see it happen in front of them, they may just be like, oh, that person's going to be fine, dude. Just walk it off. Just like, you know, let's go to the pharmacy. We'll just take care of it and not realizing that minutes can matter. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that the most important thing to take from this is that when we see those moments, you might initially see it and just kind of say, oh, okay, they mentioned food allergy. You as a food allergy sufferer might pause for a second and think, wow, that's not accurate at all. And what we wanted to make sure that everyone understands is that there should be a pause. If your child has allergies, obviously you're going to pause and let them know that this wasn't the right way of treating an allergic reaction. Action. And then if your child doesn't have allergies, they're most likely have friends or family members or somebody in their life that does. And that's also a moment where you want to pause and talk to them about what they just saw and what things were accurate and what things were not accurate. So it's just, uh, it's very important to realize that. And that's exactly what that study was talking about is just that those humorous portrayals of food allergies do lead to negative attitudes attitudes towards those with food allergies. And so those same attitudes, that same person will be less likely to offer life-saving measures in the event of an emergency for somebody having a food allergy. Yeah. And I think a lot of it is also how they portray it. I feel like there's a lot a nonchalance to the humor and the time frame in which their allergic reaction occurs is always a little bit skewed, obviously, because it's a movie or a TV show. We can't accurately show time, but it doesn't portray an accurate account of what an allergic reaction looks like. Can you give us some examples of what this humor and food allergy looks like in TV or movies? Yeah, absolutely. One of the first movies that comes to mind is Monster in Law. And at the time when it was released, I actually did watch it in the theater. So I do remember it and happening. And I was thinking, oh my gosh, to use someone's food allergy to their like harm to their disadvantage. And I've heard people say, oh, well, JLo's lips got swollen. She is given the food that she's allergic to by her future mother-in-law to be as like a way to kind of prevent, you know, the, the wedding that's coming. And it's just not funny to have like someone's lips blow up and think that it's like a plastic surgery procedure. And it's just not very nice. But in the moment, they use it to set off a lot of humor. And there are some uh, minor characters involved, too, that kind of help set up the scene. Yeah. And we're actually going to link all of these show scenes that we're talking about in our show notes. So if you're curious about, you know, the scene that we're talking about, you can definitely go into our website and look at those. Essentially, what I thought was interesting was that they kept kind of going back and forth from it being funny to it being serious. And, you know, the other like kind of supporting character kept saying, wait, this is serious. She could die 
and and the, and then they kind of level it off with the humor and make it less serious. So it, it just kept going back and forth. So at certain points, I was like, oh, they're doing a good job. Oh no, they're not doing a good job. Oh, they're doing a good job. Oh no, they're not doing a good job. So it kind of just felt like it kept going back and forth. That's definitely gives a mixed message. Obviously, that's what we're hoping the media starts doing a better job of. Yeah, and that scene also gets into bullying, which we'll talk about soon, which just like drove me crazy about the whole thing. I was like, just gonna make you not trust anyone, basically. And you know, she's eating catered food and she's questioning the caterer. And it's like even the fact that it's the mother-in-law, which is even closer, makes it so frightening. Can we also quickly, because humor and you guys mentioned it, can we talk about the scene in Hitch? Yeah, we could talk about the scene in Hitch. It's the scene where he has ingested some food and then all of a sudden his face starts to blow up. But like he's calling out kind of cries for help and he makes it seem like it's just so much more exaggerated um, and it, people laugh instead of saying oh my gosh how serious and it's like the fact that he goes into a pharmacy and is showing to be just taking the medication off the shelf and just starts guzzling liquid medication instead of of course using an epinephrine auto injector it's just done incorrectly from the get-go. The girlfriend kind of looks at his face and starts getting alarmed, but even she doesn't know what to do and she feels frantic and she's trying to, you know, find this Benadryl because that's the only thing that she understands about food allergies and just the fact that, you know, he's not carrying around his EpiPen with him and he knows that he has a food or actually, I don't know. Did he know? No, he didn't know so. that he had a food allergy. So I guess this would be the first time someone's having a food allergy. And what would be the right steps if somebody in front of you is having a first time food allergy? And obviously that wouldn't be right. So let's let's actually talk about what would be the right steps. Interestingly, you know, the, not, food allergies can happen at any age. And this is a good example to use as like a good teaching point. It's an adult. It's uh, the most common food allergies in adults is seafood and nuts. And so in this example, at least they use a good example to say that this can happen anytime. It can happen in adults. And when you start having symptoms of food allergies, you need to be seen. If you don't have a prior diagnosis, seek help. You can definitely try to find Benadryl if it's available to you, but I would actually want you to call 911. That's what it's for. And it is a true emergency because we don't know what direction we're going to go. Can we go into the misinformation that these m movies and TV shows give us when they talk about the symptoms. So in Hitch, I thought at the beginning, oh yeah, you know, it's kind of accurate in Hitch because he's clearing a throat like he feels an itch, you know, like <clears throat> I was like, oh, okay, I've experienced that. But then it, it, it kind of spirals into something comedic. In Monster-in-Law, she also has that kind of like itchy, like, <clears throat> and then it spirals. Peter Rabbit, that one from 2018, which enraged our community, he had no symptoms. I don't remember seeing any symptoms. I just remember him getting the blackberry into his mouth and then he used his EpiPen. So there was no symptoms at all that showed up there. And then in Friends, it's also a sign of like an itchy throat. And in Freaks and Geeks, he also questions the fact that he's eaten peanuts and then we cut to him on a stretcher. So what do you think that's telling us or that's communicating to people who are watching these movies? Well, the most common sign of an allergic reaction is skin. I think it's about 80 to 90 percent of allergic reactions involve the skin. And the skin to an allergist means etching, hives, swelling, any part of that, including swelling of your lips, including swelling of your eyes. That's all skin. That's all swelling. So I think it's good that they did. The media did use the most common symptom as a portrayal of an allergic reaction. But there's also something really important. Not every sign of an allergic reaction is visible. There will be moments um, that you may hear your friend, your sister, your neighbor having something more internal. And when they tell you that, you know, they don't feel good or if they tell you they can't breathe or they start to clear their throat and you're like, wait, what's going on? Are you OK? No, they're not OK. <laughs> they just they just started to show you a symptom. So they may not be able to communicate correctly or timely. So I think it's better for us to be on the on the lookout for those kinds of reactions, especially in a known likely allergen situation and a couple of those situations with the friends, with the monster-in-law, with the freaks and geeks. We know that those were allergenic exposures. 
years and then the symptoms occurred. This is where it gets confusing, either whether it's comedy or it's someone in denial that they're having an allergic reaction. Because I know I've had that experience before where I'm like, I don't really think I'm having a reaction, but maybe I'm having a reaction. I think I'm probably having a reaction. Then I can tell everyone around me is starting to panic. So I like try to make it funny, even though I'm also assessing what's going on in my system. But I'm trying to keep everyone around me from panicking because they know I've had history of anaphylaxis. And I, I don't know, how do you feel like that's portrayed in the media? Like I'm thinking about the situation in Ross, which we'll link to because you guys should watch this video. It really <laughs> enraged me is he's just being so silly about it. And they're like, oh, well, he needs to go to the hospital, and get a needle. And he's like, oh, well, I'm not going to go to the hospital and get a needle. Never mind. I'm fine. It's like, you're not fine. Yeah. And, you know, needle phobia is real. Um, even as an adult, you don't have to like needles. I don't like needles. I don't like injections. It can be very challenging if clearing your throat is all that your symptom is. I can totally understand because guess what? Food allergy is probably not the number one most common cause. In fact, it's not just probably. It's not the number one most common cause of throat clearing and post-nasal drip is not food allergies. It can be confusing and that's okay. I think it's okay to acknowledge that, but I think it's also important to start looking for where your medications are if they're not on your person already to see how the situation may be escalating. And it's okay. I would tell people like we give you a prescription, we give you epinephrine for a reason. If you're in doubt, you're not sure, it's okay to use it and go to the emergency room. You weren't sure, but you learned a lesson and you have to be, you know, we are as careful as we can all be. That's the best we can do in the moment. Yeah, and I think that that is an important point. Number one, I think going back to the definition of anaphylaxis that we talked about where it's two systems that should be involved. So in that case for Ross, for example, where, well, in his instance, it was actually not just that he was having throat clearing, but at some point his voice changed and he was unable to speak properly. And that's actually a very scary and ver worrisome symptom. And so if at any time your airway is involved, then we definitely would want you to use your epinephrine device right away. And so that's an important point to make there where you might not see those two systems involved, but where, you know, you have one very critical system, which is your respiratory and your breathing that's involved. And in that situation, you would use your epinephrine device. But again, you know, all of these nuances are things that you should discuss with your doctor. And we're just generally speaking here. But at the end of the day, it's going back to that checklist that Courtney was talking about and assessing how are you feeling? What symptoms are you having? What does your food allergy action plan tell you to do? And then going from there. And then again, in the instance of Hitch, where it was a new reaction, when you're having obviously symptoms like he was, where he was having throat clearing issues, he was having um, obvious angioedema or swelling of his face, that would be a clear indication to call 911. So, you know, it's figuring out what's a mild reaction and what's a serious reaction. Anytime that your respiratory system is involved, that's a serious reaction. If you have obvious swelling, of your face and also are experiencing that throat clearing and starting to have issues with um, feeling that your throat is patent and open, then that means that that's also very worrisome. So they're getting into these very tricky areas in the media and not really giving you a clear cut plan of what we would recommend as doctors to do. So I think you're absolutely right, Courtney, they should. And I think more shows are doing this. They are having a doctor come on as an advisor to make sure that the scenes are depicted properly because I think it's more and more relevant now that we're getting consuming everything from the media that people get accurate information. And what about the treatments that we see? How do you feel that the media portrays that side of the reaction? Obviously, as an allergist, I don't approve. <laughs> I think it just in none of those situations that I see an epinephrine auto injector, period. And we're so lucky to have access to these medications and in the situations that those movies or films were produced, it would be a very expected thing to have available and to have been prescribed in many of those situations, especially with the prior diagnosis. So definitely a misinformation about uh, treatment. And I would say in almost every single situation, the, you know, there's kind of a, um, I should kind of backtrack for a second. In the uh, Peter Rabbit, he did have an epinephrine 
an auto injector right in his pocket. The interesting thing was when the Blackberry hit his throat and he swallowed one, he I think he did point to his throat um, and then he kind of dropped suddenly. And so it was really quick. And I was kind of impressed how within seconds his reaction really changed and it brought to mind you know anaphylaxis can also mimic a lot of other situations and a lot of other things and so it would behoove us to like at least mention that not every portrayal of an allergic reaction is truly an allergic reaction and that sometimes our mind does get ahead of us and sometimes we do vasovagal we just faint so there are situations where it's okay to take a moment to assess. And I love the idea, Courtney, of using your mental checklist. And I think it's really great to sit down with your doctor and say, what are the symptoms? What should I be looking for when I have an allergic reaction so that you do use the correct treatment in a timely fashion? Yeah, I think the Peter Rabbit situation is really interesting to talk about. Hitch and monster and law and the TV shows that we've referenced, that's like 15 years ago. And I'm really not sure what EpiPens or epinephrine auto injectors were like 15 years ago. I had one, (laughs) but I just don't think that people knew about them as much as they do now. And that's also because the rise in food allergies has been so much since those movies were released. But with Peter Rabbit, which interesting is he uses it right away, which is really good. And what's what we're telling kids is epi first, epi fast, when in doubt, epi. So in that regard, I thought that was great. It was like he didn't hesitate and he's telling kids, don't hesitate. Don't be afraid. Just use it. So in one regard, I felt like, okay, actually, that was quite interesting. But in another regard, I was like, maybe he's just choking on that blackberry, even though we know they talk about him being allergic to it. But I felt like the whole thing was such a physical, comedic situation that I was like, not sure what was going on. I didn't see any signs of an allergic reaction to me. He just just kind of dropped on the ground and I had no idea what happened. And then all of a sudden there's an EpiPen in the scene. The whole thing that was going on in my head is what is this the scene telling us and where was the outrage like what were we so angry about in that situation because there's a lot of different parts to it I mean, I think this kind of takes us into the next point, which is harming others using their food allergies. And I think that was the biggest thing that I was angry about with that scene was that they were purposely trying to harm him using his food allergies. And that is obviously not the right message to give to kids. And this was a kid's movie. And so that was, I think, what alarmed me the most and the nuances of what his reaction looked like. And then the fact that he actually did use his EpiPen, right? Those kind of things were secondary to, I think, that primary thing, which was using harm, just like they did in that mother-in-law movie where they purposely were trying to hurt the person using their food allergies and minimizing the fact that they could literally have killed both of those people because of their food allergies. I mean, they were using tree nuts. They were using almonds in one of them. And so these things are very, very life-threatening. And just the fact that they were entertaining the idea of using it as a harmful tool. Agreed. I don't like that. And as a as a mom, as a doctor, as a pediatrician, I just think that those are scary situations. There's enough bullying. There's already enough self-doubt and anxiety in childhood. There's already enough situations to, to kind of come back from and bounce back from just 2020 alone. Let's not add more to our plate and let's be more accepting and, and let's be helpful instead of harmful. In one of the issues of the Annals of Allergy, Asthma and Immunology, they actually did find that 25% of children are bullied, teased, or harassed because of their food allergies. So this is a topic that we need to be aware of. This is something that we need to be asking our kids about and making sure that they don't feel like their food allergies are being used against them. And if they are, then we need to act quickly and make sure that we're addressing that issue with the school and with them and anybody that's involved. And that brings up the other point of making kids afraid to talk about their food allergy because they've seen this. They've seen how others use food allergies to harm. And that might be something that they're afraid of. William Peter Rabbit, if they knew he had a blackberry allergy, but they still, you know, slingshotted a blackberry at him. Why should I talk about my food allergies? What if someone else is going to use my allergy against me? And that's another harmful part that showing bullying on TV and in the movies can bring to a child with food allergies is that panic or that 
that sense of like fear that someone is going to hurt them. And I think, Courtney, it's a little hard these days because of like the 529s and the individualized educational plans that we as a parent and doctor want you to be separated when you're eating foods with other kids. We're encouraging you to speak about your food allergies. Let everybody know around you that, you know, you need to be mindful about where you're eating. And then at the same time, it's like, well, if I tell everybody what my weakness is, what am I going to do when they use that against me? And I think it's about teaching kids that you're you are more than what you eat and what you are allergic to it should not define who you are and I I mean you personally do a great job with that it's just realizing that there's two sides to every coin and that this is a health matter this is not something that we're going to pick somebody on because you wear glasses or you have braces or you have to walk in with crutches like it's just not something that we need to be drawing attention to more than just awareness and leave it at that. And I think you brought up an interesting point because I know that this has been a topic that's discussed often is should kids be separated that have food allergies while they're eating or should they not? And how much emotional harm does that do to a child when they have to be separated while they're eating? One article that I read a while back was just talking about how this needs to be more of like a shared decision making activity between your allergist, the family and thinking about the way that the school functions and also the severity of the allergy that your child has in the sense of previous anaphylactic reactions and all these kind of things that could play a role in making that decision. And I think that that's something important just to mention here is that it isn't a one size fits all and not all kids should be separated from other kids while they're eating and that it is something that you can have a conversation about with everyone involved and trying to figure out if your child is going to be more harmed than helped by separating them. Yeah, there's a lot of variables. And the problem is that it's also based on the age of the child, the number of students in the classroom to the number of teachers present to monitor. There's just so many variables that are actually outside of the allergist and parents control. So this is where school districts get involved because they kind of know the more intimate functionings of their day-to-day practices. And then, you know, with 2020 and the pandemic aside, right now we're forced to be physically separated. So uh, it's a different situation altogether at this moment. But I think that you bring up some great points. Like, do we want to separate our kids? Do we like doing that? Of course not. I've had to deal with this in my practice over the last few years, parents coming in and saying, Dr. Raylan, please write us a note. Um, We want our kid to sit with everybody else at the the cafeteria. And we kind of have to dissect it piece by piece, you know, and I absolutely think it needs to be individualized. Yeah. And I think that's the key point that we realized is, you know, at one point we kind of had these strict thoughts in our head, remove any risk factor and just keep children safe. But now we realize that they very complicated situation. And, you know, at times it can cause more harm. Like you said, the age of the child and so many other factors needs to be factored in. So hopefully, actually, maybe we will have you back on and we'll do another episode dedicated to that topic, because I think it is very, very important. And to have us discuss all the nuances that we might want to think about, I think would be helpful for parents before they go into their allergist or before they go in to talk to their school and figure out what their plan might be for their child. Well, and that gets us into another point regarding the media and how people are portrayed. And, you know, one of the topics was the nerdy and not cool aspect of the portrayal of people in the media with food allergies. Manisha, can you comment on that? I think you could use it more of like a description of a character and like setting it up as more of like a character trait that they're portraying food allergy children to be the nerdier group. And it's like categorizing them, boxing them in a way that it's not fair because we're each individual who we are and I can tell, you know, I can tell you guys that I feel I'm a nerdy person, but that's not for you to decide who I am. And I think I'm using my food allergies and automatically saying, oh, all kids with food allergies are just nerdy. That's just how it is. And I think that's the negative portrayal that a lot of the screenwriters have used in the past. And it's somewhat of a form of bullying um, in a sense that you're kind of coming with your own preconceived written notions. Anybody with a food allergy just can't hang with me because, you 
you know, I can eat whatever I want and you can't. So therefore, we're not friends. I do think that some things have changed in the past. I mean, like I said before, and a couple of times is that we are referencing some perhaps dated movies and TV shows. And I was wondering, I haven't been so good at keeping on track of like the newest and coolest TV shows or movies that may have uh, food allergies in them. But do you feel like things have gotten better in the media since the early 2000s? So yes, this is totally a personal and a dope kind of situation. I have two kids and my oldest uh, was really into Daniel Tiger a couple of years ago. And so we fell into this episode and I, you know, I hear the word allergy and I turn around and I'm like, what? <laughs> There's allergy on PBS? What? <laughs> and so I, uh, I tuned into the episode a little bit more closely and I was really impressed. You know, Daniel Tiger has a food allergy and he's a very beloved, sweet character. And back in Mr. Rogers neighborhood kind of days, he's like an offshoot from a beloved character of my own childhood. So the fact that he has a food allergy and the fact that they portray the symptoms, they talk about going to see the doctor, getting a treatment plan. I thought it was really well done in a way that children can relate and the fact that bullying is in the media, it's not just children, it's adults too. And I think that it's important as we're getting older and kind of defining food allergies and food sensitivities and food intolerances, more and more people are gaining awareness. It's nice to see that it can start at a younger age. And so if you're look, listening as parents or grandparents to this podcast and you're trying to think, how can I learn more about this in a simple way? You know, there's books geared toward children and there's film. And now we have characters, even Arthur, they talk about food allergies. And that's a more of an older age group. So I think more like elementary school. But I think it's super cool of PBS to be doing this. I'm I'm very proud of them. Are those both PBS shows? Yes, they are. Oh, very cool. I'll have to check those out. PBS does a really good job at explaining food allergy because I I know the episode you're talking about with Daniel Tiger and I am a huge Arthur fan. And what's really cool about Arthur is it's actually Binky who has the food allergies. So he's the bully. Typically, he's the bully in that constellation and Binky is the one with the food allergy and it's like Binky's crew is trying to protect him and what I love about both of those episodes is that they are so inclusive and they show the friends also being a part of managing the food allergies and having the friends stand up for the kids so that they don't feel like they're doing it alone and the other thing is both of them push the idea of knowing more about what you have. So the more you know, the more confident you feel. And I thought that was really cool that they both showed the kids repeating what they learned from the doctor to their friends to educate the people around them. So in that regard, I think things geared towards children are really positive and maybe it's just things in the mass media that are a little bit more problematic still. I mean, we see it in comedians as well using food allergies as the butt of the joke. Yeah, I think that it's really nice to show positive examples also today because I think there are some out there and I definitely want us to link to those episodes that you guys are talking about so that parents have like a go-to from the show and then if anybody else has any other episodes or any other moments in TV that they were really impressed by what they saw, we would love for you to share those with us so that we can share them with our audience and make sure that we spread the message about, you know, the positive and helpful images of food allergy in the media that I've learned a lot from this episode. So I want to thank you, Manisha. I feel like we covered a lot of really helpful topics. And as a new mom, I think these are the kind of things that I really like to keep on top of to know not only, like we said, if Phoenix ends up having an allergy to know how to teach him about his allergy or just to teach him about allergies in general, because he will have friends and family who have allergies. So I think that it's just a really important topic to shed some light on. So I want to thank you for being on the episode and even just coming up with this interesting way of talking about anaphylaxis with us today. Thank you so much for having me on your podcast. I was so excited. I still am so excited to talk about this topic. I think we could have spent literally like another couple of hours dissecting each scene 
screen setting it up for you guys for those of you listening but again it would have been a couple more hours and I think that the best way to see those episodes is to click on the link and to actually see them because the scenes speak for themselves you know they say a picture is worth a thousand words and you can't describe everything in the moment but I think looking at them and then hearing what we had to say as our interpretation because this is all this was was you know our individual approach and perspective and then to kind of sit back and say all right what did I take away from this what do I think will be something that I will hopefully do different if this like scene literally appears in front of my own eyes and if you're you know if you're not sure you ask that person even if they are a stranger even if they are masked and they're clearing your, their throat like are you okay it's still okay to talk to people and it's still okay to be on the side of like caution there's never never wrong when you when you help somebody out I think that's a really nice way to end it is to say like we can watch these scenes now and use them as teaching moments with your children teaching moments with your friends just so you say this is what you might think an allergic reaction looks like but let's break it down so that if I am having an allergic reaction you know what to really look for and you know how to really help me in this situation and do not put my EpiPen through my breast because this is not a Tarantino film. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. I think, I, like I said, I learned a lot from this episode and just researching and thinking about it. It was just very helpful to go through it. So again, if anybody has questions, if they have another episode that they'd like to dissect with us, we're more than open to talking to anyone about it. We'll definitely link all of the episodes that we've been referring to in our show notes and until next time thank you for listening to today's episode remember that all information you hear today is for informational purposes only and are not intended to serve as a substitute for the consultation diagnosis and or medical treatment of a qualified physician or healthcare provider and also don't forget to subscribe to our podcast and if you have a second help spread the word by rating our podcast and sharing with your friends and family who might also be interested in learning more about allergies, asthma, and immunology. You can always stay up to date by checking out our Instagram, The Itch Podcast, where you can leave questions you are itching to know or check out our website, which is www itchpodcast.com, which contains more information about the subjects we covered in today's episode and every episode. Until next time, have a fabulous week. 